Welcome to My Hometown, the program that explores clubs, organizations, businesses, and issues across Nassau and Suffolk counties and sheds light on the different towns that are making a difference. Hello and welcome to My Hometown. I'm Bill Horan, along with my co-host, Nassau Community College student, Mike DeMarco. Today, we're going to take you back to the history of Long Island. So take out your number two pencils and open up your books and get ready to learn, Bill. Oh, I'm ready. Today, we're going to meet Christopher Verga and Carl Grossman, the authors of a new book from Arcadia Publishing called Cold War Long Island, and learn about what Long Island was like after the end of World War II and how that shapes our home today. History class is in session. Christopher and Carl, welcome to my hometown on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Christopher, I understand that you're part of the faculty at Suffolk Community College. Can you tell us a little more about yourself? Yeah, sure. So uh, I teach uh, Long Island and New York history in Suffolk Community College. In addition to that, I also teach major world cultures and foundations of American history. I have uh, multiple books, uh, Saving Fire Island from Robert Moses, Civil Rights on Long Island. I also have uh, World War II, The Long Island Homefront, and I uh, got this book, Cold War Long Island, which I co-authored with uh, Carl Grossman. K- kind of, uh, if we limit it to Long Island, you're like the James Patterson. Uh, you're the prolific writer who knocks out books, what, every year or two? <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe yeah faster. actually, I, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, yeah, kind of. Uh, you know, I got another book coming out in uh, August as well. What's the title of that one? Uh, When Dixie Came to Long Island, it's about a uh, black World War II soldier uh, coming home and coming home. And he was on furlough, actually. He was still enlisted in uh, 1946. And he got into an altercation with a police officer, a verbal altercation, and the cops shot him and killed him. And it sparked actually a large investigation through the FBI, through the military. And uh, Woody Guthrie had a uh, great song about it in addition to this. That, that sounds, it's a great title, too, because it draws you in. You have to ask the next question, so it's perfect. So, uh, Carl, uh, you are a professor at SUNY Old Westbury. Can you tell us more about your background? Yes, and I have many students through the years uh, from Nassau Community. I teach journalism at uh, SUNY Old Westbury. Uh, I teach investigative reporting. Uh, I teach a course in environmental journalism. I also run the internship in journalism program at the college. Not only do I teach investigative reporting, uh, but that's been my specialty for many years. Uh, I was a reporter at the Daily Long Island Press until it went out of uh, business in 77, and I jumped in 78 to SUNY Old Westbury. So I not only teach investigative reporting, with a particular focus on environmental issues. That's why I teach environmental journalism, too. But I do investigative reporting with a special focus on environmental issues. Now, Carl and Christopher, uh, how did the two of you know each other? And what got you to write a book on the Cold War on Long Island? Well, I was uh, putting together a book, Saving Fire Island from Robert Moses. And uh, it's an environmental book had to do with the uh, environmental movement on Long Island. And uh, Carl here, he, he, he's an institution here on Long Island, uh, especially in terms of uh, environmental journalism. So that's how we uh, got to meet each other. And uh, after I got done my World War II book, another one that came out in uh, 2020, I, I wanted to do a sequel, and that would have been Cold War uh, Long Island. And, uh, you know, I, I can't write a Cold War Long Island book without uh, someone that's uh, that reported on all the issues I'm researching about. So, uh, you know, I came across Carl and asked him if he wanted to be part of the project. And uh, Carl has a lot to bring to the table. And uh, Carl did. Uh, you know, Carl shaped the book to what it is what it is and the success it is. So readers really get uh, two experts for the price of one. People <laughs> who really know Long Island. No, I mean, all the historical aspects. And I'm sure it's as I look through your book and read through it, it's fascinating. Names came back to me from years ago. Uh, things I thought I knew about. I have learned lots more about it because we're reading from the experts who are telling us. So uh, it, it's a fascinating book. So how was life on Long Island changed with the Cold War? Let me just unpack that a little bit. So we have World War II, and uh, Long Island prior to World War II was a rural appendage of New York City. And this region, Suffolk and Nassau County, is going to go through a very, very rapid 
modernization and transformation um, from the entry into World War II to the end of World War II. And it's going to continue to grow. And what's going to grow is what we know of the suburbs, uh, the aviation industry is going to be built on, and also some contemporary problems we still struggle with today. Um, at the end of World War II, we had that great optimism, but uh, during the Cold War, we kind of veered off and became a little, uh, I guess, we kind of lost our way a little bit on that optimism um, on the what society could bring. And the Cold War kind of tested us as a region, and it brought Long Island from essentially to its modern birth to its middle age. It's important, too, and we note in the book how... Uh the Cold War, in a way, begins on Long Island because the United Nations, before it went to New York City, was in Lake Success. And in those early years of the, the UN, uh, there was this conflict between the Soviet Union and, uh, and the United States being played out in Lake Success. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I, I, I think I remember that from childhood, but looking at it in your book to say, wait, the United Nations, something that's, of course, known all over the world, was a few miles away in Lake Success from Nassau Community College. And for some of our listeners, they're probably sitting literally right there where the United Nations was. Just such an amazing historical fact that uh, luckily you brought up. And now, when I was looking at your book, naturally I flipped through the table of contents. I said, what's going to catch my interest? And you probably can guess that it was chapter six because that said spies. And we're always interested in spies. And we don't think of Long Island as a hub of Soviet spies. So uh, can you talk about that? And what were their targets? What were they looking for? You know, we, we were potato farmers. We had ducks. What, what, what were they looking for here? Well, I, um, Carl actually met one of the spies, uh, but because uh, he was actually <laughs> reporting on him. But let me unpack sure blame poor Carl, who's nice and quiet there. <laughs> now, let me unpack the spy thing a little bit. Long Island, it's not the first go around with spies. During World War II, we had Nazi spy rings that traversed uh, all across Nassau and Suffolk County. Um, during World War II, you have the German American Bund, which is pretty much the American Nazi Party uh, later on. And they had their Camp Siegfried rallies. And at these rallies, you had these German sympathizers and, uh, you know, you had German ambassadors finding who works in aviation during these rallies. And to make a long story short, Everett Rhoda, who was a top engineer for Sperry's, uh, he was a spy and he pretty much gave the Nazi Luftwaffe um, our technology for autopilot and bomb sites. So spies on Long Island is not something new, even with the potato fields. You know, we do have the aviation industry, you know, tucked in between these potato fields. But uh, yeah, Robert Thompson, he was a, uh, he was an interesting type of spy. Um, I'll let, I'll, I'll let Carl deal, deal, deal with this aspect a little, but I'll just give you, give you a quick overview. His, uh, to my understanding, his job was to pretty much just document and report how, uh, how like everyday uh, Long Island is in suburb and suburbia lived so they can produce and make a more appropriate Soviet spy. Uh, (laughs) Carl has a great story to share with this one. So I'm going to turn it over to Carl. Now the exciting part. Here we go. (laughs) That's one of the Cold War stories I covered it as a reporter at the Long Island Press. Uh, The Associated Press uh, Tick a news ticker uh, announced uh, that a Long Island guy, Robert Glenn Thompson of Bayshore, was uh, arrested as a uh, a spy for the Soviet Union. Uh, I drove down to where he lived in Bayshore, interviewed neighbors, kind of a mysterious character, had a big, tall antenna right in back of his house, which is kind of curious. It wasn't just a <laughs> antenna. It was a very tall antenna. Uh, the next day, uh, he had been uh, arraigned uh, at fed- in federal court, and his attorney, uh, Sid Seidman, had a press conference. Uh, Sid was always big on publicity, so uh, at a press conference in, uh, uh, in Bayshore, where, on Main Street in Bayshore. Now, my car uh, broke down on the Sunrise Highway, so I was late to the press conference. Uh, But I got there and I knew Sid and he said, well, I'll sit you down with uh, Thompson and his wife uh, in in our conference room. Uh, And he did. And uh, Thompson told me this whole story about uh, 
how he was in the Air Force, uh, uh, and he was stationed in Germany, and uh, he was in intelligence. And the um, uh, just shows you you can't believe what a spy tells you. <laughs> and the, this now the Vietnam War was happening. We're in a Cold War period, serious Cold War period. And the uh, the Air Force wanted him back to do intelligence. And he, in fact, that was the headline of the Long Island Press. I shook when the FBI came. He told me about how the FBI came to his fuel oil business in Bayshore and essentially threatened him that if he didn't get back into the military to help the U.S., he was going to be busted. In any case, he was busted, charged with being a spy. Uh, again, he denied it all to me in a long, long interview. But then uh, several months later, the Associated Press ticker ticked again. And the story was about Robert Glenn Thompson pleading guilty to espionage. And I uh, somehow he was allowed to go get out on bail before sentencing. And I went over to his house in Bayshore, knocked on the door. And uh, I could see through the, through the, the screen door that uh, he was sitting there with his uh, two sons, uh, he invited me in. He was happy with that earlier story, which turned out to be uh, not true. I mean, what he had told me. And he told me to sit down. And uh, interestingly enough, he was sitting, drinking a can of beer with his two boys, watching <laughs> the TV at the time, I Spy, which was uh, <laughs> kind of ironic. And then, then he went on to tell me what he did. You can't uh, make this stuff up, you know. <laughs> well, no, no, not really, uh, <laughs> I tell this story to my students about how you have to be so careful, particularly when somebody who's in espionage tells you something. And he, then he went on to tell the truth uh, that he uh, ran around the New York metro area taking photographs of strategic targets. And he exchanged the film up in uh, Niagara Falls on the International Bridge with uh, uh, Soviet officials and so forth. I mean, he, he, was, he was a spy. Finally sentenced to, uh, I think it was 35 years, a long, but he was traded for a um, uh, for a, an American spy. Uh, so uh, he got out eventually, but uh, this was, a, again, it's all part of the Cold War and Long Island very much, with not just Robert Glenn Thompson, but in many ways, very involved in the, in the Cold War period. You are listening to My Hometown on the Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Mike DeMarco, along with Bill Horan. And today we are speaking with Christopher Verga and Carl Grossman, the authors of a new book from Arcadia Publishing called Cold War Long Island, and learn about what Long Island was like after the end of World War II and how that shapes our home today. Bill? And Carl, I, I just wanted to say that was actually the section I was reading last night. And I, I think your next book, I'm going to give you a title for it, The Spy Next Door, because <laughs> none of us think that, you know, our next door neighbor is a murderer, a thief, a spy, a philanderer, anything. But we do know if you take it by the numbers, somebody is doing something wrong, even if they're cheating at their Little League games or a bingo or something. But The Spy Next Door on Long Island, we don't think of that. And I know this guy was like perfect because he bragged about his military from what I was was reading about you say when you walk in he's he's watching i spy on television do you think you'd <laughs> shut it off uh, back in those days we only had six channels you could have switched the channel or just shut it off don't bring the spy aspect into the game and everything about his life i think he drew attention he was kind of a racist and drew attention to himself in the neighborhood and uh, kind of did things to upset his neighbors so uh, I, I think you you've probably got some fascinating stories uh, if we could sit down and talk to you for a few hours it would be a lot of fun. But uh, let me go on to Mike now because he has other questions for you. Oh, well, one thing I thought was interesting that uh, glanced over was a little segment about Plum Island. And I remember fishing um, outside in the sound like near uh, uh, near the coast of Plum Island. And we used to joke because I think there's supposed to be some science labs or something that's out there. And we used to joke that we're going to catch some fish with like five eyes or something <laughs> like that. But I I'd like you to tell us more about the birth of Plum Island. Well, once again, this is something Carl covered uh, and broke the news. Um, the founder is Eric Traub, and he was a uh, former Nazi that worked under Heimlich Himmler for the Biological Warfare um, pro um, Program. Uh, I'll, let, uh, I'll let the fault to Carl on this one. So, Yeah, and, and he had actually connections to Long Island before World War II. 
Chris just mentioned Camp Siegfried. It's this area in Yapank, which uh, was a parade, a Nazi parade ground for uh, Nazis in the entire New York metro area. Uh, and around it was a, a community built by the Nazi Bund uh, with streets like uh, Hitler Street and Goering Street and so forth. And this fellow, Eric Traub, uh, because he was here in the United States studying at the Rockefeller Institute, uh, as a, uh, a Nazi, he'd go to sing, say, Camp Siegfried, and he was involved in its, uh, its activities. Then the war occurs, and um, he goes back to Germany, and he's given the uh, position of running a laboratory in the Baltic, Reims, Isle of Reims uh, in the Baltic. And its mission was developing ways to poison the livestock of the Soviet Union. Uh, in fact, uh, a reporter who's a Nassau County resident, a great Newsday reporter, I've done a lot of investigating. I started investigating Plum Island back in 1970. But John McDonnell of Newsday was on the story as an investigative reporter for uh, uh, for Newsday. And he, he really documented how Plum Island was set up through the, uh, and well, what happened was Traub, who came to this country as part of operate coming back to this country as part of Operation Paperclip. Uh, this was a program in which uh, various Nazi scientists and engineers like Werner von Braun, uh, the, uh, this, uh, the guy involved, he became associate director finally of, of NASA, was brought here and helped the United States develop uh, uh, the Redstone rocket, first rocket capable of uh, carrying a nuclear weapon which was uh, based on von Braun's V2, V for Vengeance 2 rocket, that he, uh, was the program was in charge of for uh, uh, the Third Reich. In any case, uh, Traub, because of his connections back in the 30s, went to Fort Detrick in Maryland and convinced the folks in Fort Detrick, he knew a number of them, let's set up a, an island, uh, set up on an island here, in the United States, a program to, again, the same thing he was involved in in World War II for the, for the Nazis to poison Soviet livestock. And John McDonald for Newsday, in Newsday, had facsimile documents of the, of the mission, the original mission for Plum Island, the Animal Disease Center on Plum Island. Again, this is this is an actual government document which was reprinted in Newsday. Plum Island will permit the Chemical Corps, this is the Army Chemical Corps, to execute required projects in connected connection with imported agents. Uh, John McDonald's the lead of his story, a 1950s military plan to cripple the Soviet economy by killing horses, cattle, and swine call for making biological warfare weapons out of exotic animal diseases at a Plum Island laboratory, now declassified army records reveal. A Plum Island is a mile and a half off Orient Point. Uh, and that's what it did for a while. But then, uh, uh, now here's another Long Islander who uh, wrote a, an, an excellent book called Lab 257, Mike Carroll, about Plum Island. Uh, Mike is an attorney, and he dug into the uh, uh, the records of Plum Island uh, in the National Archives, and he found uh, documents indicating that the Pentagon decided, hey, let's forget about this plan to kill the uh, these food animals in the Soviet Union because it'll end up, we'd have to feed millions of Russians. Let's just, <laughs> let's just use nuclear weapons on on these Soviet people. So the, the mission wow. of, of Plum Island was changed, but was it changed? Because two other excellent investigative reporters at Newsday, this is in, you know, later in the 70s, uh, disclosed that in the 70s, in the 70s, uh, African swine fever suddenly got to Cuba. And there was this... Uh, all, all kind of deaths uh, to the to the pigs to the swine uh, in Cuba, and what uh, what Newsday was able to do was connect the dots in regard to uh, to that uh, that situation and link the CIA, uh, a military U.S. military base in the Canal Zone, 
and Plum Island because African swine fever, this, this terrible disease, only existed in the Western Hemisphere on Plum Island for uh, experimentation. Or, or In any case, Plum Island have, people have, have always claimed to me, well, when our mission changed, the focus became looking into foreign animal diseases to try to prevent them from coming to the United States. We only do defensive biological warfare was the additional claim. Now, I don't know about uh, that claim. <laughs> I mean, uh, this is an island shrouded and it still is shrouded in secrecy as to what it uh, really is about and as to whether it really ended doing the kind of thing that Eric Traub uh, envisioned it doing, a biological warfare against the Soviets, uh, really ended, whether they've continued through this years, these years in uh, engaging in uh, developing biological warfare to be directed at an, an enemy's animals. You are listening to My Hometown on the Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Mike DeMarco, along with Bill Horan, and today we are speaking with Christopher Verga and Carl Grossman, the authors of a new book from Arcadia Publishing called Cold War Long Island, and learn about what Long Island was like after the end of World War II and how that shapes our home today. I got to say, that whole story was extremely impressive, especially because we used to joke about Plum Island because uh, me and a close friend, we used to go fishing out, like I said, in the Long Island Sound, and we'd be sort of off the coast of Plum Island. Not too close, of course, but we used to talk about the stories we've heard, you know, uh, I guess folklore, so to speak, about weird things that they were doing there. But one thing I want to ask you, and correct me if I misheard you from the story, so Plum Island essentially was started and operated by an ex-Nazi? It, it, it was the dream, it was the vision, it was the recommendation of this, uh, this Eric Traub uh, to uh, Fort Detrick is the place that is the U.S. Center for Biological and Chemical Warfare through the years. And he, uh, now he comes over here with Operation Paperclip and he advises his uh, former uh, friends here in the U.S. who now were in positions at Fort Detrick to set up uh, the kind of laboratory that he had during the war. Uh, so, uh, uh, again, <laughs> it, right here off off Long Island. And in terms of crazy stories, I mean, I've been to Plum Island three times. And the first time I was to Plum Island, uh, and, and in fact, why they opened Plum Island, why I got there the first time, it was the first time they opened it to the press, uh, is because I was investigating biological warfare on Plum Island, and uh, so was Newsday, and they figured they'd be able to do a dog and pony show and convince us everything was fine there, and all they're doing is uh, looking into uh, foreign animal diseases, as I mentioned before, and in terms of biological warfare, at the most uh, defensive, whatever that means. There's not much of a line between defensive and offensive biological warfare in terms of the research aspects, certainly. And at one point, uh, one of these uh, scientists with their, uh, you know, the white uh, uh, kind of jackets that these me medical people wear, lifted up a vial of foot and mouth disease virus. And uh, he said, there's enough foot and mouth disease virus to kill all the cattle on earth. And then he went, <laughs> and in fact, there's enough foot and mouth disease virus in this vial to kill all the cattle that ever lived on earth. And, and, and I said, oh well, my what God, put mouth disease viral virus. And he's well, it's not biological warfare. It's not biological. <laughs> warfare. He was so defensive. But it, it, kind of this is all in the category of, well, it's a Cold War activity, but also, frankly, in the category of mad science. I mean, you, you, you can mention fishing near Plum Island. The problem with Plum Island, uh, the government finally decided after 9-11, is that it's, it's right on a sea leather ferry that goes to Connecticut. Cross Sound Ferry passes right by Plum Island. There's always fishing people around Plum Island. Just sits there. Uh, very accessible, very vulnerable. The government count accountability office decided after 9-11. And, and terrorists can hit it. And there are disease agents being worked on, the GAO said on Plum Island, that not only affect animals, we're cross over to people. So here, here's this island set up under the weirdest of circumstances 
the po- to poison the the cattle and the reindeer and the other animals in the uh, in the Soviet Union. In the middle, I mean, Boston is uh, was about 45, 50 miles to the northeast. New York is 100 miles to the west and in a population center. And so what the government had been doing in recent years, it's to open next year, is set up a replacement for Plum Island uh, in Kansas, which is a kind of a dopey place to put a also a dopey place. At least it's a, at least it's more remote. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's 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 a, the, the, it's cattle country. I mean, that's true. <laughs> uh, it's it's. I mean, if there's a leak and there's been accidents, something. The second time I got to Plum Island, some of the foot and mouth disease virus somehow escaped from this supposedly sealed laboratory. It got out into a pen. The cattle, the pen got infected. Had to be had to, had to be slaughtered. Uh, so if if there's a problem in this Kansas uh, agro defense facility, it's costing well over a billion dollars to be completed next year. But meanwhile, local politicians on eastern Long Island, including the congressman from uh, the first congressional district, Lee Zeldin, have been pressuring the government not not to, not to shut down the uh, the Plum Island lab, but to preserve the island. Uh, because of its ecological importance. Yeah, but this is like, you know, making, uh, I don't know, uh, Love Canal, a national <laughs> preservation area. It's, it's uh, a lot of the stuff that they worked with, the agents, the animals that ended up were not taken off the island for disposal. Uh, there, some were incinerated. A lot of the stuff was buried on the island. And there's all kind of environmental hotspots on the island. But in any case, Zeldin and others and environmentalists who are well-meaning have been trying to keep the island preserved. And this is Zeldin's big bit. He's, he's like a Trump acolyte. He's a, he wants to run for governor, now New York governor. He wants to keep the laboratory going. Christopher and Carl, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're just This is fascinating, but we're running out of time. So at this point in the show, we want to thank our guest, Christopher. Verga and Carl Grossman, the authors of a new book from Arcadia Publishing called Cold War Long Island. We appreciate you taking time to be with us and your stories are fascinating. Thanks so much. No problem. Thank you. I'm Bill Rand. I'm here with Mike DeMarco. We thank you for listening to this week's special edition of My Hometown. We like to get your feedback on My Hometown. Send your comments to whpc at ncc.edu. Nassau Community College, where success starts and continues. Till next time, this is Bill St. James. And remember, there's no town like your hometown.